For the first talk, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Sabi Grewal. Sabi is a student at UT Austin, like me, under the supervision of Scott Aronson. Uh, and he's done some really nice work on efficient algorithms for learning quantum states. And today he's going to tell us about one such work on learning a new class of quantum states efficiently, uh, namely non-interacting fermion states. So take it away. Uh, thanks for the introduction, William. So yeah, my name is Sabi Graywall. I'm a student at UT Austin. I'm going to be talking about the efficient tomography of non-interacting fermion states. This is a joint work with my advisor, Scott Aronson. I wanted to start off by talking about quantum state tomography. This is one of the fundamentally important tasks in quantum learning theory. It's the problem where we're given copies of a quantum state, and we want to reconstruct a classical description of the state that's close to the original one. So what do we know about this problem? Uh, for like a decade now, we've known that full state tomography is a hard problem. Specifically, to reconstruct a quantum state, you need a number of copies that scales exponentially with the number of qubits. And one motivating question in quantum learning theory is, when and how can this exponential scaling be avoided? And on Monday, Richard set this up nicely. There's like two high-level things you can do. One thing you can do is try to learn less about your state. And this line of thinking has led to some wonderful algorithms over the last few years, like pack learning of quantum states, shadow tomography, and classical shadows, which we heard about on Monday. Um, but except for some restricted settings, these algorithms remain computationally inefficient. And kind of the thing we want to dig into in this talk are which learning tasks permit time-efficient algorithms. And in particular, we still want to reconstruct the entire state, but we want our algorithm to run efficiently. And we've learned in the last few years that there are a number of, of classes of quantum states that permit uh, efficient learning algorithms. Among these are stabilizer states. Um, just maybe like two months ago, this was generalized. Uh, the stabilizer state learning algorithms were generalized to any quantum state that can be prepared by Clifford Gates and a logarithmic number of non-Clifford Gates. Uh, phase, this is also true for certain phase states, for matrix product states. And the point of this talk is that non-interacting fermion states can also be learned time efficiently. I do want to note that Brian O'Gorman um, independently gave a fermionic tomography algorithm that we discuss further in our paper. And also, the phase state learning paper is here at TQC as well. It'll be, there'll be a talk about it later today in the other room. OK, so that's efficient tomography. The next thing I want to talk about is what are non-interacting fermions. So in the standard model, every particle is of one of two types. <clears throat> It's a boson or a fermion. Roughly speaking, bosons are typically the force carrier particle, like photons and gluons. Fermions are particles associated with matter, like electrons and quarks. And given a system of particles, we, we say that a particle is in a mode. And a mode is just an abstraction. So if you care about the position or momentum or polarization or whatever of your particle, this is abstracted away into a mode. And this gives us a pretty simple picture of the configurations our systems can be in. So here we have a system of two particles in three modes. And in particular, the first two modes are occupied, and the last one is unoccupied. And the distinguishing characteristic between bosons and fermions is that for bosons, two particles or more can occupy a single mode. And for fermions, this is forbidden. This is the Pauli exclusion principle. OK, so we know the configurations our fermionic system can take. So how do we write down the state? So we take this configuration, and we write it down as a string of bits. So we have three modes, so our list has three elements. One to signify the mode is occupied, and zero to signify that the mode is unoccupied. And this generalizes in a straightforward way to n fermions and m modes. We have a list now of m elements that can be zero or one. And the sum of the bits needs to be n, because there are n fermions. And the set of all possible lists of length m with Hamming weight n captures all of the configurations your system can be in. We denote this by lambda mn. 
And it's a quick counting thing you can do in your head that there are like m choose n such configurations. And the way we write down a non-interacting fermion state is we just, it's a superposition over possible configurations of your system. And when you measure your state, you'll observe some configuration uh, that with a probability that goes like the amplitude squared. In this work, the number of particles is, is fixed to n. Uh, but even still, our quantum state lives in an exponentially large Hilbert space. And our goal is time efficient tomography. And so even writing down this list of amplitudes will take exponential time. And so like one prerequisite you need that needs to be satisfied to give a time efficient learning algorithm is you need to have some succinct way to represent your state. And it's been known for, for decades now that, that the fermionic systems we're studying here do have a succinct description. Specifically, if you have n fermions in m modes, you can describe it by a matrix, which we denote by k, that's m by m. Its rank is n, it squares to itself, and it's Hermitian. So this, this type of matrix describes a fermionic system, or at least the, the kind that we're studying here. And the way you get measurement probabilities from this description is by finding a submatrix of k and computing its determinant. So sp specifically, if you want to know the probability that any subset of modes is occupied, you compute a principal minor of the matrix k. And I think the quickest way I can show you how that works is just showing you a simple example. So let's say we want to know the probability that the second mode is occupied when we measure our system in the standard basis. So there could be many fermions, and we just want to know whether one of them will be in the second mode when we measure. And this is our like toy setup, just a system with four modes. So since we're interested in the second mode, um, we will, sorry. What we'll do is we'll select the second row and delete all the other entries, the second column, delete all the other entries, and we're left with a one by one submatrix. And to get the minor, we take its determinant, which is just trivially the entry itself. Another, oh, and you know, this must be real because our matrix is Hermitian. Another example, um, just to, to make sure this is clear, um, we'll compute the probability that the second and fourth modes are occupied. So to do this, we select the second column and, and fourth column. We select the second row and fourth row. We're left with a two by two submatrix. Its determinant tells us the probability that the second and fourth modes will be occupied when we measure our system in the standard basis. The next thing I need to tell you is that unitary evolution is also succinct. This has also been known for decades. And actually, if you, um, a un, an m by m unitary specifies an evolution of a fermionic system. Specifically, there's a function, which we denote here by phi, that maps an m by m unitary operator to a larger unitary operator acting on the space of n fermions. If you're familiar with match gates, what this uh, function is doing is it's mapping u to a particle preserving match gate circuit. And the way the evolution works is just the standard way that you'd expect. And the key thing here is that this evolution is described succinctly. So the evolution of our sit state of n fermions uh, corresponds to the succinct description uh, being updated by conjugation by u. So at this point, I think I can sort of take stock of what we've talked about so far and just state what our goal in this paper is. So these systems of non-interacting fermions have a succinct description and the unitary evolution is also succinct. You get measurement probabilities out of this succinct description by taking submatrices and computing determinants. And what we want to do in this work is we're given copies of, of a non-interacting quantum state and we want to output a matrix k hat such that the corresponding state is close to the original. And should be no surprise that that's what we do in this work. We show that if you're given a non-interacting fermion state, you're able to reconstruct the state to trace distance epsilon um, with this many copies and, and this much time. 
And just to give a high level overview of how the algorithm works, we fix like m different measurement bases and we collect a bunch of measurement data and we show how to use that measurement data to recover the entries of k to like a plus or minus gamma accuracy. So each entry of the matrix is recovered to some additive error. And if you'll remember, because K is describing a fermionic system, it has to satisfy some list of requirements. It needs to be Hermitian, square to itself. It needs to have rank K in order for it to actually describe a state. And even though K satisfies these things, if you add this statistical noise to the entries of K, the resulting matrix in general will not satisfy any of them. So there's some cleanup work to do at the end of the algorithm so that the, the matrix does satisfy these requirements. And then we output the resulting matrix. And in order to show that this algorithm is correct, there are two technical questions that we need to answer. The first thing is we need to, we need to study how the distance between the succinct descriptions, k and k hat, relate to the distance between the states. And we also need to figure out what gamma suffices in order for the states to be close in trace distance. Um, so this is pretty much everything I want to say about the algorithm, but I do want to give you some sense of how the error analysis works, how we answer these questions. So to answer the first question, we prove this theorem that the trace distance between the states is bounded above by the square root of the spectral norm between k minus k hat with this like extra root, root n factor. And to figure out which gamma suffices, we make use of this theorem. It's called Weil's inequality. It's like over 100 years old, but I hadn't heard of it until I worked on this project. I wanted to share it um, in case anyone here doesn't know about it. Basically, what it says is if you have a Hermitian matrix and it's perturbed slightly, its spectrum cannot change too much. The version of that that's relevant for our work is we have three Hermitian matrices, k, k hat, and some matrix E, where k is equal to k hat plus E. So you can think of k hat as a perturbation of k. Um, then the, the, the spectral norm of k minus k hat is bounded above by the spectral norm of your perturbation. So Weil's, in, Weil's inequality is much more general than this, but this is the version that we need for our purposes. And if you remember, our algorithm recovers the entries of k to an additive error. And so we're able to show that our perturbation matrix is Hermitian and all of the entries are like order gamma. And that's actually enough to get an upper bound on the spectral norm of E. And, and that's enough to like complete the analysis. So now I want to turn back to quantum state tomography. So what I've claimed so far is that we're able to reconstruct a Hermitian matrix um, and that unitary evolution works as shown. And the problem of state tomography is actually like pretty much the same thing. We have a Hermitian matrix that des describes our system and, and unitary evolution works the same way. And we actually show that our fermionic tom tomography algorithm can be ported over to become a state tomography algorithm. And the algorithm is exactly the same. And the only thing that changes is the analysis because the learning goals are slightly different. In the fermionic case, we needed to bound the spectral norm. And for state tomography, we need to bound the one norm. And we're able to get a tomography algorithm uh, that uses single copy measurements that has the following performance shown on the screen. Now, this is not the state of the art. Uh, as far as I can tell, the state of the art was a paper that was at TQC a couple years ago. Richard is on the paper. Um, here, little r is the rank of the density matrix. So this algorithm does particularly well when your density matrix is low rank and you want to recover it to some constant error. And our best lower bounds for state tomography that use single copy measurements are also shown now. And you can see there's a gap. And I think one of the major open questions in quantum state learning is trying to close these gaps simultaneously. So, um, so yeah, so the first direction for, fu for, for future work that I want to propose is digging into these connections further. I, like, so what we've shown is that a fermionic tomography algorithm gives you a state tomography algorithm, or at least in our case it does. 
And so if you optimize our algorithm further, you should get faster tomography algorithms. And I think there are a number of places in the analysis and the algorithm where you can speed up, where you can speed things up or tighten things. And maybe the lowest hanging fruit among these is the fact that our algorithm does not use the low rankness of the matrices we want to reconstruct. So for the fermionic case, we know that our matrix K has rank N. And uh, we don't use that at all. So that structure, you should be able to exploit that structure to, get, to already get speed ups. And then in the other direction, there are many quantum state tomography lower bounds. I think it's worth investigating whether those can be ported over to get lower bounds for fermionic tomography. And then I'm going to end with one final open question. It's the distribution learning version of, of the question studied here. So basically, we're trying to learn the standard basis distribution using only standard basis measurements. This is actually the first thing Scott and I worked on, and uh, we weren't able to do it. Um, and we're very interested in knowing if this is possible or if it's hard. Um, an equivalent way of stating the problem is that you're given a distribution over bit strings of length m with Hamming weight n. And the probabilities of, of observing a particular bit string is given by this determinant of a principal, that's given by this principal minor. And uh, the way you obtain this principal minor is exactly the same way as we saw earlier. And there, there is some evidence now to think that this problem might be hard. Like a month ago, um, it was shown that the general case where the particle number is not fixed, this problem is as hard as learning parodies with noise. But at the same time, in the classical machine learning literature, this problem has been, a similar problem has been studied. But like the, the only difference is that the matrix K is symmetric with real numbers rather than Hermitian. And they were able to give some non-trivial algorithms, but nonetheless, they're able to solve this problem. And so there's kind of like a tug of war here. Like either there's some hardness transition from going from the symmetric case to the Hermitian case. I don't know of any example where that happens. So if anyone does, I'd be interested to know. Or on the other hand, this problem is solvable. And if that's the case, we know that there, the algorithm needs to be highly non-trivial. And we discuss a lot of the barriers you run into in designing an algorithm in our paper. So it's worth looking there if you're interested in more detail. And that's basically everything I had to say. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thanks. Thanks, Sabi. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, great talk. I had a question about the inequality that you gave relating trace distance to uh, spectral norm uh, between the like uh, reconstructed matrices. How tight is this? Do you know if this is saturated? I, I don't know if it's tight. Uh, that's a good question. Like That's another opportunity where you might be able to just get speed ups from the analysis. I, I don't have a strong sense of if this is tight or not. Are there other questions? Okay, let's start here. Hi, yeah, uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, you, you mentioned that when you learned the matrix K, uh, you later have to fermionize it by making sure that it's a uh, projector of rank K. How, yeah. how costly is that kind of post-processing? Um, it's not too costly. Like, so essentially, the, 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 it's, the cost of it's dominated by diagonalizing the matrix. And so that's like, it, we have m by m matrices here, so that's like m cubed time. Uh, or it might even be matrix multiplication time. I'm not sure. But yeah, like m cubed. Um, so I was interested in the, the restriction you made to um, fermion number of preserving uh, like fermionic operations. So do you think that's something that fundamentally has to be there in your analysis, or is it just like convenient? Or um, it's usually not number preserving is okay as well. 
Yeah, yeah, it's usually not number preserving. Yeah. Um, yes. So yeah, fixed particle number. Um, the reason we studied this case is like the connection to, between fermions and the de determinant is like much more apparent when the particle number is fixed. Yes. When the when the particle number isn't fixed, you get like Fafnians. Yeah. And uh, I guess coming from the CS side of things, uh, we're sort of interested in like the easiness of the determinant versus the hardness of the permanent. So we just fixed the the particle number for that reason. For for the case of tomography, this is something I actually started thinking about in like the, over the last week or so. I'm pretty sure that if the particle number isn't fixed, a very similar algorithm and analysis should work. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I don't think you'll run into any barriers. I thought the same. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Or? Okay. Um, so if I understand correctly, your algorithm gets a bunch of individual samples of the state and then measures each one of them somehow and then does classical post-processing output. So if I give you more power and I then let you, I give you all these copies of the state and I let you do some fermionic operation on this whole product state and then do some measurement, can you do better than your algorithm or? Yeah, that, that, so that's like very related to like looking at this connection between state tomography and fermionic tomography. Mm -hmm. Like we know in state tomography, um, you can do better if you get, you, if you have quantum memory. Yes. And I expect the same thing to be true in the fermionic case, but I, I, I don't know, I'm not certain that it's true. Okay. Yeah. I have more questions, but I'll ask you later. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, are there any more questions? Thanks for the clear talk. Um, okay. Two questions. Uh, first, uh, can you elaborate where the epsilon to the four dependence comes from? Like, one could optimistically expect an eps one over epsilon squared. And second, uh, have you thought about a bosonic version of, of this protocol? Could this, this also work, or is, are there some some uh, obstacles? Uh, yeah. So, I don't know if the epsilon to the fourth is necessary. It shows up. Like the reason it shows up in the fermionic case and it doesn't show up in the tomography algorithm is because the, we're trying to get bounds on two different norms, like the two norm versus the one norm. And that's where the epsilon to the fourth shows up, but not for the state tomography. I have no idea if that's inherent. Uh, like, yeah, I think, lo like, yeah, again, porting lower bounds from state tomography to fermionic tomography could like, shed light on whether epsilon squared or to the fourth is the, the right answer. Um, and then, oh yeah, the other question, bosonic tomography. Um, yeah, that's, I also don't really have much to say about that. Uh, I kind of expect it to be hard, but I'm not sure. Like, yeah, it's, I, I don't really have much to say about bosonic tomography. It's definitely worth looking into, because I think the thing you'd expect is for it to be hard. Uh, or at least for me, like I'm, I'm used to seeing like boson sampling and stuff where you have a lot of hardness results. But it could be that learning is, is, is possible. Yeah, I'm not sure. Any last questions? If not, let's thanks, Abby. <laughs>